The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello everyone. I'm just going to let uh, a few more folks pop on here. I see there's a couple um, sliding onto our attendees list. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, just while everybody's kind of getting settled and getting uh, sorted out here, I'll just do um, a little quick introduction. So my name is Taylor Fraser, and I'm the manager of partner engagement for the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency. And uh, I'm going to be your host for today. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, our session is slated for about 90 minutes, uh, depending on the number of questions. We may go a little bit over. So um, we're, we're glad you're, you're here with us for the evening. Um, so also, if you're on Twitter, uh, feel free to tweet along with us. Um, you can see in the top corner of your screen our Twitter handles up there. Um, so you can tag us in your tweets and uh, we'll be watching. So um, thanks again. And we'll be, we're going to be recording this session. Um, so we'll share the link with all, our, all of our attendees after and um, make, make it available to those who did not make it here today. Um, if you have a slow connection, um, feel free to close your webcam view window and uh, that should help speed up your connection a little bit. So um, we do have four presenters this evening and um, you'll be able to he hear and see us and them, um, but we won't be able to hear and see you. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to type them into the questions box or the chat window. Um, it's just on the side of your screen in the control panel. Um, you can do this at any time throughout the presentation, so we'll try and take some questions um, between presenters if we can. Um, and if we don't get to them, we will get to them at the end um, during the Q&A portion. So I just want to introduce our four speakers today. Um, I'm going to try and pop their webcams on so you can see who they are. Um, we've got Melinda German. She's the general manager of the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency. Uh, Tracy Herbert, Extension and Communications Director at the Beef Cattle Research Council. Uh, Ron Glazer, the Vice President of Corporate Affairs for Canada Beef. And Tom Lynch Staunton, the Manager of Partner and Stakeholder Engagement from the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. All right, so after our four presentations today, we're going to move into a Q&A session. Um, so we'll be taking questions, including the ones that um, all of our participants submitted throughout the webinar that we didn't get to. Um, and anything new that comes along um, between the last set of questions we answered. Um, again, uh, just use the control panel on the side of your screen um, and pop those questions and comments into there and we'll make sure we get to them um, when we can. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Um, it's Melinda German, uh, the general manager of the checkoff agency. So Melinda's role is to oversee the administration, collection and remittance of the checkoff and to work collaboratively with industry associations, including uh, the provincial cattle associations and other national groups um, in regards to all things checkoff. So welcome, Melinda, and I'm just gonna give you control of the screen here. Oh, you're muted, just one sec here, Melinda. You're gonna have to unmute yourself. There you go. There. Now I'm good. Okay. Thank you, Taylor. And thanks everyone for joining us. <clears throat> this is our second webinar today, and it's our pleasure to be able to uh, discuss with as many people as we can over the le next little while all about the federal levy or the national checkoff that you've heard so much about. Um, what we've been doing as a group, as the, the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency who administers the national checkoff, and those that use your dollars like Canada Beef, BCRC, and Issues Management. Um, we've been getting out to town hall meetings 
face to face with producers across Canada. We've uh, done some meetings here in Alberta, more AGM type meetings, but we've been out to Manitoba, uh, Ontario, and we'll be going out to New Brunswick next month as well. So we thought this was a great opportunity to reach a wider audience across Canada to be able to tell you a little bit about the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency, what we do uh, with your national checkoff dollars, and then also be able to have an opportunity for you to hear from those folks that are using your dollars and hear from them about uh, programs they have in place now and programs that they're thinking about for the future with the increase to the checkoff. So you're going to hear from me for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over to those important people to tell you all about their programming. <clears throat> so as Taylor mentioned, I'm the general manager of the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency. Uh, we have a board of director of 16 folks with representation from across Canada. So we have representation from each of the nine provincial cattle associations. Alberta has two directors, every other province has one. We also have four directors from uh, Canadian Meat Council one director from Import Export Canada, one from Retail Food Service. So we have a great uh, cross-section of industry people on our board of directors that um, provide us high-level guidance and advice and direction in terms of the oversight of the Canadian checkoff. Um, I, I think I mentioned, or maybe I hadn't quite just yet, the, the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency operates under federal law. <clears throat> and so we actually operate under a, a federal act called the Farm Products Act, and we report into Farm Products Council of Canada. And for the privilege of being able to collect a national checkoff or a federal levy from beef producers in Canada, we're provided with um, high level rules of how those dollars can be spent. And that's part of the agency's job is to provide that oversight to uh, the funds and how the funders are using it, ensuring that we're meeting our mandate. So you'll see on your screen, the um, direct uh, lines out of our proclamation that tell us what the agency, the Canadian Checkoff Agency is authorized to do. But in general, what we're allowed to use those dollars for is market development, promotion, and research. And so that's why you're going to hear from those service providers tonight who do those activities on your behalf. I want to just take a, a couple minutes and just talk a little bit about provincial versus the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff or the National Checkoff. I also refer to it as the federal levy. Um, I, I use Manitoba as an example because I worked in Manitoba for the last 13 years and I'm, I'm familiar with its, its system and its structure. Uh, in total, producers pay when marketing cattle in Manitoba a $4 checkoff. And three of those dollars are provincial checkoff. And those three dollars go to the Manitoba beef producers uh, to support their programs and activities. One dollar is remitted into the agency, into the Canadian Beef Checkoff Agency. And those dollars are earmarked for the national programs that you're going to hear about tonight. So what I'm going to really talk about tonight is that one dollar and the move to increase that one dollar to two dollars and fifty cents. So we're going to talk about how that's come about and what benefits we may be able to see from those increased activities as well. So just back to the role of the agency, as I mentioned, we operate under a federal act to be able to collect this one dollar and we have to report to the federal government. So annually, I have to submit uh, upon approval of my board of directors a business plan uh, how the dollars will be spent in the new fiscal year for all those using that money. And we've just completed that and we'll be uh, presenting it to Farm Products Council of Canada next month um, to show them the plan of how dollars will be used for the 1819 fiscal year. What we also have to do is report to, to them annually on how we actually did spend the money. And that report actually does get tabled in Parliament as well. So we have to adhere to some pretty strict uh, regulatory guidelines and processes and that's a major role of the agency in terms of overseeing national checkoff dollars going into national programming. The other things that we do is we work with the provincial cattle associations. Uh, we help them uh, deal with collection and remittance issues with slippage, et cetera, and try and streamline that process. 
And of course, we work with our provincial partners or national partners uh, to ensure that there's good communication about the national checkoff, the programs that are doing and the reporting that we're doing as well. So high level, that's the role of the checkoff agents. I've mentioned our service providers uh, quite a bit already. Um, as, as I mentioned, we are allowed to use those dollars for market development. So one of our um, service providers is Canada Beef. We're allowed to use it for promotions. So that's something also Canada Beef does. Uh, but I guess in a way also issues management that you're gonna hear a, a lot more about tonight. And we're allowed to use it for research. And so that's where Beef Cattle Research Council comes into place. We enter into agreements with these groups to provide these services on your behalf. Now provinces also can take some of those dollars back to use for provincial initiatives. Um, they do have to do the same reporting that our national groups do as well. So you've heard a lot about the increase, I'm sure, moving from a $1 federal levy to a $2.50. Why did this come about? Well, we've actually had the privilege of collecting a federal check off um, for almost 20 years, and it hasn't changed in terms of amount in those 20 years. So when we, we factor in um, uh, just basic inflation and other pressures on that $1, we're actually operating on about a 70 cent dollar. We also know over the last several years that we've seen changes to provincial government funds, um, being able to be leveraged by our service providers at Canada Beef, BCRC, to augment the programming that they do. And of course, no surprise to you, over the years, we've seen reduced marketings and a shrinking cow herd. So all of this has put pressure on the programming that groups like Canada Beef and BCRC have been able to do in the past. Around 2014, the nine provinces, the Provincial Cattle Producer Associations got together, along with five national groups, Beef Cattle Research Council, um, uh, the Canadian Beef Breeds Council, Canada Beef, National Cattle Feeders Association, and CCA. These groups sat down and said, as a group, we need to be working together better, and we need to develop some programming that's going to continue to advance and move the Canadian beef industry forward. So the National Beef Strategy was struck, and a, a, a plan was put in place to grow and expand the Canadian industry through four different pillars, where service providers like Canada Beef, BCRC, and Issues Management play a significant role. When these groups came together and developed the strategy, everyone agreed to it in principle. And then we started looking at what the cost would be to fully implement this strategy. And that's how the checkoff increase came about. The groups looked at what was needed to be able to fully implement those four pillars in the programs and activities. And the decision was to move forward with an increase to the national checkoff from $1 to $2.50. These are the four pillars, and I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I'm sure many of you have seen this before, and you're also going to hear a little bit more uh, from the service providers tonight on how some of their program falls into these pillars. But these pillars are around connectivity, enhancing our synergies within the industry, increasing our production efficiencies, reducing our, our disadvantages when it comes to competitors, and of course, increasing beef demand. So these are the main four pillars of the strategy. As I said, I'm not gonna go into any detail, but I'll direct you to this website where you'll be able to find uh, several different resources that you can uh, dive deeper into what these different groups are doing and how they're utilizing your dollars. So have a look at www.beefstrategy.ca for some more information on the national strategy. So these national groups came up with a plan. They said to fully implement the plan, a checkoff increase was required nationally. The process then is it's not the Canadian Beef Cattle Agency that says thou shalt increase. This is a province by province de uh, decision. So what happened after the national strategy was struck and an increase was decided on, provinces went back to their producers through their district meetings, zone meetings, county meetings, uh, whatever's applicable in your province. Um, discussion started around the national strategy, the programming, and the need to increase. 
Every province then, um, we had uh, seven out of the nine provinces so far successfully complete um, discussions with their producers and resolutions being passed at their annual general meetings to support that increase. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of update in a few minutes about where each province is at. So provinces went out, discussed this with their producers, Votes were made at district or county meetings, and then resolutions were taken forward to their annual general meeting where they were passed. Once those resolutions were passed, that's when the agency started to work with the provincial cattle associations to start to amend the provincial and federal regulation to be able to increase. Then our next job is to continue to work with those provincial cattle associations to continue to communicate through activities like tonight um, the checkoff increase, um, how it's happened, why it's happened, and some of the benefits that we see from this increase nationally. So I mentioned um, money going to service providers. When your one dollar is sent into Calgary into the National Checkoff Agency, uh, we don't arbitrarily decide where your dollars go. That is in the hands of each individual provincial cattle association. And yearly, those provincial groups will send us uh, their decision of how their monies that they send in shall be allocated between marketing, promotion, research. So they'll tell us, uh, based on those functions, how to allocate those dollars, and we'll send it then to those service providers that are focusing on those uh, function areas, such as BCRC, Canada Beef, and now issues management under the, the new strategy. And of course, I mentioned that some provinces do take some of those dollars back for provincial initiatives as well. So here's what it looked like in 2016-17. So this is uh, solely a $1 checkoff. Uh, checkoff revenue was around $7.3 million. And this is broken down by dollar value and by province. So you can have a look at that and see whatever province you're in. Uh, where you stood in terms of national checkoff remitted into the agency that went to national programming. What I wanted to point out also was something relatively new, and that's the import levy. So we've always had this mechanism in our, in our regulatory framework to be able to collect on beef and beef product being imported into Canada but we never actually developed the mechanism to do it until about four years ago. So it's been up and running for three and a half, four years. And last year we collected just for $900,000. So not insignificant in terms of the dollars collected that can go towards national programming. Uh, the dollars that are collected are based on, as I said, uh, live animals. So it's a $1 per head being imported in, or it's, uh, collected on a $1 equivalent per kilogram on beef or beef product coming in as well. Now, one of the things that we were sure to, to look at on the beef imports is that this programming goes towards generic programming. And Ron's going to talk a bit more about this in his presentation, so I won't go into any more detail. But this is for generic programming where we see work being done to continue to encourage the consumer and the public to consider beef as a top protein choice when they're in the grocery store and to increase their beef consumption. So this is an important one that I also wanted to mention is once we have national treatment across Canada, where every province is collecting the $2.50 national checkoff, we're able to go forward and increase the import levy as well. So we're gonna move from about 900,000 to just under one and a half million dollars in terms of, uh, uh, two and a half million dollars, sorry, in terms of uh, dollars coming in on the import levy to be used for generic national programming, which is pretty significant. So where are we at? This map here shows two things. It's showing agreements and it's showing checkoff increase. The agreements are just agreements that um, we've been updating with each provincial cattle association. The, the only thing these agreements do are appoint basically a provincial cattle association, our collector of the national checkoff. And they also allow provinces to allocate those checkoff dollars as per what I've just discussed in terms of dollars be going towards marketing, research, and, and promotion. So to date, we have six out of the nine provinces signed on to new agreements, and BC will be signing on here right away. Um, that'll just leave Ontario and Quebec, and uh, we're continuing to work on those. 
Where are we at with the checkoff increase? We've actually had three provinces already implement the increase. Nova Scotia was first out of the gate over a year ago, January 1st, 2017, followed by PEI in June of 2017, and New Brunswick implemented just this month, February 1st. Um, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta will be moving forward and implementing the checkoff increase April 1st, BC July 1st. Quebec will be uh, moving forward sometime in 2018. And in Ontario, it has not yet gone through the uh, process that I've just described previously uh, to gain that support from the producers. So we're, we're still waiting and seeing where we're gonna land with Ontario. So that's where we're at to date on the checkoff increase. Uh, basically, by end of 2018, we'll have the majority of the country um, on to the, the increase. This is just a projection of how we think the dollars starting in April 1st, 2018, will be uh, split up between our service providers. So this is based on the best information we have to date in, in terms of if we know a province will have moved to $2.50 and if they've provide us, provided us their allocations. So what we're projecting right now, we're looking at a revenue of around $14 million, uh, just under 60% to marketing, um, 28, 29% to research, around 4% to issues management, and about 7.5% going back to some provinces for provincial investment. Of course, this will be subject to change as folks come online with the increase and provide us um, new allocations. One of the other main things that the agency does is evaluate the effectiveness of checkoff. So we've committed every five years to conduct a study to see what the return on investment is for producers for their checkoff dollars being submitted to national. We just completed our, our last study uh, in 2016, and what we found for every $1 uh, sent in and spent in, in these national programs returned $14 back to Canadian beef producers. This is up from our previous study done about six years ago, where we found a nine to one investment. So we continue to see good value in terms of the return of those dollars coming into national being spent on national. But what we also see is how well we're doing compared to some of our major trading partners. And in the little red box in the corner, you'll see that the United States uh, and Australia, they, they have a checkoff system as well. They also conduct these evaluations regularly and their return on investment in the US is just a little over 11 to one and in Australia, it's six to one. So as I said, we're continuing to see good return on investment. And this is something that the checkoff agency will continue to monitor and will be conducting uh, these studies regularly as we evaluate the impact, especially in light of the checkoff increase that we're gonna start to see happening in 2018. I'm getting close to the end of my presentation. I, I just wanna encourage you to stay connected with us. As I said, we're the administrators of your dollars, but it is important for us to be transparent about what we do. We encourage you, if you're a beef producer, to stay connected through your Provincial Cattle Association. You will have a representative that's appointed to, to our board. Um, I'll also encourage you to sign on to our gatepost. It's a monthly electronic newsletter that goes out. It's a very short, quick and easy read that just gives you some highlights, not only from checkoff and administration of your dollars, but what some of the main service providers are doing and what's new with some of their programs and activities. So I do encourage you to, to sign on and stay connected. With that, Taylor, I'm gonna end there. Happy to answer any questions if anything's come in thus far. Otherwise, uh, I'll be ready to turn it over to Tracy. Uh, awesome. Um, we don't really have any direct questions yet. There was one, um, a question about if this uh, webinar will be available offline after. Um, yes, we are going to rec record the webinar and we will be sharing a link afterwards. So if there's some information you missed or you want to need to revisit anything, um, never fear, we will be sharing the recording of the webinar after. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is Tracy Herbert. She is the Extension and Communications uh, Director for the Beef Cattle Research Council. Uh, Tracy oversees the development and maintenance 
um, and the utilization of various research and extension tools. Um, this includes the beefresearch.ca website and uh, focuses on the adoption of innovation related to production, animal health, food safety, and beef quality. So welcome, Tracy, and thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Taylor. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your evening to join us tonight. So for the next 20, 25 minutes, um, I'm going to explain how a portion of the national checkoff dollar or federal levy uh, funds beef and forage research and extension, and then the plan of how the BCRC will spend additional funds on those things. So I've been with the BCRC for uh, just shy of about six years and originally from a farm, a mixed farm with purebred cattle in northwest Saskatchewan. So I have my own small herd there that's uh, running with my folks. So that's home for me. I am one of four full-time employees with the BCRC. We also have uh, two people part-time who do some admin support for us. So we are a pretty small but mighty team. So the BCRC is the national industry-led funding agency for beef cattle and forage research. And our job at the BCRC is to identify, fund, and communicate about research priorities that have the greatest potential to advance the competitiveness and sustainability of our industry. So the BCRC doesn't own laboratories or employ scientists. Rather, what we do is we identify priorities, collect funds from industry and government, and use those dollars to fund and support research products, projects um, of high priority that are conducted at universities and uh, government research centers. So the BCRC's funds um, is funded by producer dollars. So it's producers who decide how those dollars are invested. And the producers on the BCRC are appointed by the provincial cattle groups. And the number of producer reps from each province is proportional to the amount of national checkoff that that province allocates to the BCRC. So it's proportional representation. So I know um, Melinda in her presentation covered how the uh, the checkoff works, but um, I, I meet a lot of producers who mistakenly think that um, that the provincial checkoff funds provincial um, initiatives, whereas the national checkoff would fund the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, but that's um, incorrect. So I just wanted to clarify that you know when you pay checkoff, you're paying two distinct levies. All right, the provincial and the national. Uh, provincial checkoff ranges depending on what province you're in. So in some provinces it's two, um, others it's three or 350. And you know it does. It's collected by the provincial cattle association to fund provincial initiatives. But provincial cattle associations also use that provincial provincial checkoff money to pay an assessment to the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. So it's through provincial checkoff dollars from across the country that the Canadian Cattlemen's Association um, is able to do the work that they do. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. Tonight we're focused on the national checkoff um, and currently that funds two things, right? So market development and promotion, uh, which is done by Canada Beef. And you'll hear from Ron Glazer here shortly. And, uh, and then research and extension by us at the BCRC. And so with the increase in national checkoff, a third thing can be added to the right-hand column here, and that would be issues management. And Tom Lynchton will uh, explain that to you uh, near the end of our session tonight. So each um, provincial producer group determines how the national checkoff dollar is allocated. And when the checkoff was first introduced, most provinces allocated about a nickel to the BCRC, but over the years that's gradually increased. So you can see here the percentage um, that each province allocates towards the BCRC. So you can see that ranges from uh, zero up to 30%. To look at this same information in actual sense instead of percentages would look like this. So Melinda mentioned that Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI have 
implemented the increase to 250. They are allocating 30% to BCRC, so that's 75 cents. Um, and going back to percentages here, on average nationally, it works out that about 19% uh, comes to the BCRC and as Melinda mentioned you know as some of the provinces increase to 250 effective April 1st it's projected that in the coming year um, about 28 percent would be allocated to research. So we take the producer dollars that we receive through the National Checkoff for Research and we use those to match additional research dollars through government um, to get more work done. So we're currently managing what's called the Beef Science Cluster. So that's a $20 million pot of money, which uh, $5 million of which came from industry, primarily through the National Checkoff. And uh, the other 15 million came from government, primarily from Ag Canada. And so the cluster is funding, you know, a portfolio of different projects over a five year period. The current beef science cluster is just about to wrap up. Um, it'll be done March 31st, and so the results of those projects will be coming out very soon. And we're looking forward to an announcement by Ag Canada uh, related to the third beef science cluster, which would cover us for the next five years. So with the current beef cluster, the second one, um, this is where the cluster funds are going. So we fund research aimed at uh, beef quality, food safety, animal health and welfare, feed efficiency, and forage and grassland productivity. So Melinda talked about the national beef strategy, and I want to touch on the BCRC's role in that national beef strategy because research plays a role in achieving the targets set out in each of the strategy's four pillars. And the strategy lays out a fair bit of detail about the work that'll be necessary to achieve those targets. It also explains why the increase is needed to get all of those things done. Research especially plays a key role in the productivity pillar. Ag Canada and provincial governments used to pay for all of the production research, but that's changed now that the vast majority of taxpayers aren't involved in primary agriculture anymore. And one of the things that's really become obvious is that if we as an industry don't invest in research, governments won't either. But the good news is, is that when industry does invest, that attracts government funds. So I'll tell you a story uh, related to forage research that'll kind of illustrate what I mean by this. When the BCRC first got started, our annual budget was about 500,000. So of course that limited how much we could fund in any one area. And uh, forage is an area that really got neglected. Part of the thinking at the time was that if the forage industry wants forage research done, the forage industry could pay for it, but the forage industry doesn't have a way to fund research because they don't have a checkoff. So over that time period, um, when governments were looking for places to cut their research budgets, they often picked forage. And industry wasn't investing, so industry wasn't really paying attention. And so governments, you know, got away with eliminating a lot of forage research positions. Canada went from 23 research forager, or excuse me, forage researchers in 1980 down to just eight in 2010. So we lost forage breeders and agronomists and grazing researchers, and that meant that a lot less work was getting done, and the number of new forage varieties released dropped by 80%. So if industry doesn't invest, neither will government. So this is where we were, but finally somebody in the, uh, the grass farming world pointed out that, you know, if you want to keep growing and grazing and feeding cattle, you need to pay attention to what's going on in the forage research world. So we did. 
Aspen, because of the government funds that we leveraged through the first science cluster, our budget had grown. The pie got bigger and we invested a bigger slice of that pie into forage research. Well, the pie grew again uh, with the second cluster and the size of that forage slice got bigger again. And with that increased investment in forage research, we started to see results. We saw researchers making progress in forage variety development, in forage agronomy, um, low cost winter feeding programs, and we started to see new researchers getting hired again. In the last two years, Ag Canada has hired six new forage researchers across Canada and have plans to hire more still. Uh, we've also seen three new forage researchers hired at the University of Saskatchewan and at the University of Manitoba. So this is great that we've got these new researchers, but we need to help them get their careers started off on the right foot. So the BCRC started a researcher mentorship program to help them do that. Because many of the researchers um, that start out new, they're, you know, they're new to Canada or new to the beef industry, or they might be new to agriculture altogether. And they're highly skilled and talented scientists, but they need help understanding the industry um, so that they can focus their talents in the best ways. So, you know, and this mentorship also helps them to get more comfortable talking to producers and developing their extension skills so that they get their research results into the hands of producers that can really use them. So we've put 14 researchers through our researcher mentorship program so far. Uh, they're at institutions across the country. Uh, we've mentored all different kinds of researchers. Uh, over half of them are from outside of Canada. And uh, what we've done is we've matched each of the participants up with someone who works in the industry as well as one or more producers. And over the course of the year, they are in regular contact with their industry mentors. They attend industry meetings and they learn about uh, industry and production issues. So good solid research results are essential, but they're not enough, right? Because research results also need to get into the hands of industry so that they can be adapted and adopted on farms, in feedlots, in vet clinics and in packing plants. Um, so that, you know, you really realize the value of, you know, investing in that research to begin with. And, Governments used to do a lot of extension, but they've really pulled back uh, in most provinces. And extension is in another case where if we want it to continue, we really need to support it ourselves. The BCRC has become quite active in extension over the past five or so years, mainly through developing resources through our website, beefresearch.ca. So, you know, we at the BCRC, I don't think that we'll ever have the resources to have, you know, the traditional boots on the ground ag reps. But what we can do is we can make sure that solid, reputable, relevant information is available to anyone with an internet connection or a smartphone. And, you know, encourage ag media and other industry groups to reprint or share the resources that are on beefresearch.ca so that they're, you know, readily available and easy for you to find. Um, beefresearch.ca has a lot of information and tools that should be of interest to you and valuable in, for your uh, operation. For example, we've got research overviews. So these summarize issues and the current state of knowledge around many different production research questions. We've got production tips and how to's. And one I think that, you know, you might really be interested in is this one, which explains um, regulation changes being made by Health Canada that essentially mean that 
as of December 1st, 2018, virtually all livestock antibiotics will require a prescription. So you'll no longer be able to grab a bottle of you know, penicillin or tetracycline at your local farm supply. You'll need to get a prescription from a vet and you'll need to have a relationship with that vet in order for them to be able to write you that prescription. So if you haven't already seen this article um, or got your hands on this list of all of the uh, antimicrobials you know, licensed for use in cattle that will need a prescription as of December 1st, uh, you know, head to our website um, or if you're on Twitter, I've tweeted a direct link to this. Um, so just search for the hashtag beef webinar and you'll find the direct link that I tweeted to this article. So we've also got uh, information that's aimed at clarifying common misconceptions that are often found in the media, like concerns around antibiotic resistance and hormone implants and the impact that beef production has on the environment. And we've got summaries of all of our research projects, whether they're projects that are still ongoing now or the results of completed ones. And we've produced some videos that are aimed at introducing producers to, you know, what the science says on things like body condition and carcass quality, pain mitigation, antibiotic use, and the environmental footprint of Canadian beef production. We have uh, tools that help producers make informed decisions that benefit their cost of production. So some of these things are new innovations, but some of them are reminders of things that we've known about for a long time, like the value of maintaining cows in ideal condition. So this decision tool that's, that's on beefresearch.ca illustrates the economic importance of maintaining moderate body condition. You know, by meeting the cow's nutritional requirements throughout the winter and, you know, maintaining optimal body condition would be worth about $70,000 in this example. So it's, it's looking at 100 cows in ideal condition and assuming that you're going to sell uh, weaned calves at $1.50 a pound. So that's where you come up with the, the 70,000. But if your feeding program doesn't account for extreme cold to the point where cows would be thin uh, at calving time, which means they'll be slow to cycle and rebreed, they'll calve later the next year and therefore wean lighter calves, that would drop the value of next year's weaned calf crop from 70,000 down to 43,000, even if you get um, a bit higher price for those lighter weaned calves. You can also figure out uh, what it would cost to improve the body condition of your herd based on the feeds that you have available and what they cost and, and how the extra feed costs um, to improve cow's condition would compare to the extra value from next year's calf crop. So that's one example of, of a decision tool that's available on our site. Um, we also host webinars that have become really popular and we do them every few weeks in the fall uh, and winter and early spring. They generally last an hour or so and they give you an opportunity to learn from and ask questions from Canada's leading beef researchers and communicators. So you'll come away with a better understanding of the topic and tangible advice that you can use. So um, we do have one more um, before we wrap up for the you know spring and summer on uh, getting the most out of your corn silage. So if you're interested in that one, head to beefresearch.ca, look for that webinars button um, and get registered for this webinar. And on this webinars page, you'll see the recordings of all of our past webinars. So any that you've missed, all those recordings are available there for you too. So I encourage you to subscribe to our blog if you're not already. It's you know, quick and easy to get signed up. And when you do subscribe, you'll get emails from us a couple of times a week with 
new research results or science-based production advice or other useful information. And of course, it's, it's an easy way to get regular updates on how the BCRC is um, spending your checkoff. For any producers uh, that don't have good internet access, we've got our website available on USB drives as well. So hopefully, um, you know, I've made the point that investing in research and innovation really benefits our industry in a number of ways. You know, one being professional capacity, making sure that we've got the infrastructure and expertise to continue to do research and to ensure that we've got capacity in place when critical issues arise. Of course, applied research also improves our production competitiveness. So gains that have been made um, related to feed efficiency or extended grazing systems um, are good examples. Research also supports the Canadian beef advantage and, and quantifies the claims that, you know, when we promote Canada as being the best producer of beef. Uh, investments in research are also needed for science-based policy, regulation, and trade. Uh, you know, cattle transport and antimicrobial use are a couple examples. And science-based public education and advocacy can help clarify confusion and correct misconceptions around things like the environmental impacts of beef cattle. Um, and you know, maybe get some more awareness about uh, environmental benefits from uh, beef production as well. So, you know, things used to be uh, more simple at the BCRC when all we did was fund bottom line research to improve producers' productivity and product quality, right? You know, maintaining or improving the productivity of our animals and our land and our, our forage yields while maintaining or even improving our superior carcass quality. But we have a lot more demands on our resources now. Things like antibiotic resistance and animal welfare and environment and other issues are taking a lot more of our time and resources now than they ever used to. And so we need solid research to give us effective solutions to deal with all of those things. But we can't devote all of our attention to emerging issues, right? Because at the end of the day, we still need to be able to profitably raise cattle and beef that's going to satisfy our customers. So we need to find a balance between all of these things that we need to do. And the National Beef Strategy is about finding that balance and about ensuring that the industry um, funding is committed to carry all of it out. And so, of course, the industry resources we're talking about is the increased national checkoff from $1 to $2.50 a head. Of that $2.50, um, it's recommended that $0.75 cents or 30% of that be allocated to the BCRC for research and extension. But, of course, as uh, Melinda explained, that that decision is entirely up to each provincial group. So that $0.75 cents would allow us to do a number of things. Most importantly, it would allow us to just keep doing what we have been doing. You know, we've been working really hard to make sure that we can do as much as we can with what we have and, you know, improving coordination and collaboration with the other um, research funders in the country to make sure that national checkoff funds are being invested in the highest priorities with the, the greatest opportunities for success without duplicating uh, anything that's already been invested in by others. But at a certain point, doing more with less turns into doing less with less. Uh, increased funds would also uh, support badly needed work in other areas that we haven't had the resources to be as active in. 
So I talked a lot about how forage research fell apart when industry wasn't supporting it heavily enough. We are approaching that with food safety and beef quality and feed efficiency and surveillance for antimicrobial resistance and animal health as well. Um, we probably don't need to do everything um, all from scratch here in Canada, right? There's probably some great production research and practices that are going on elsewhere in the world that we could adapt here if if we knew what they were and, and where they were. And so an increase would allow us to do, um, you know, a technology scan across the country as well as internationally and adapt some of those things to make sure that um, that they can be utilized here at home. Um, we need to expand our extension network because there's a lot of small extension activities that are going on out there and if we coordinate them you know I think we could really make some big things happen and and really make some headway in increasing the adoption levels of certain innovations or best practices that would benefit producers across the country that haven't yet um, been adopted to a great extent. And one thing that I haven't talked about yet was um, verified beef production program, right? Because VBP falls under the BCRC as well, and it's expanded significantly in recent years. And VBP isn't just about on-farm food safety anymore. It now includes animal welfare, biosecurity, and environmental sustainability. So this slide kind of is a nutshell of how the BCRC will spend uh, increased checkoff. There's more information in our handout that's um, in the handout section on your control panel. And there's also um, a longer version a more detailed explanation on our blog um, that I've also tweeted out a direct link to. So again, just search for the hashtag beef webinar and you'll find that direct link. So, you know, just in summary, the, the national beef strategy and the national checkoff increase, they're about growing our pie bigger so that we can really achieve our vision of a very dynamic and profitable cattle and beef industry in Canada. So I'll be happy to answer questions right now if any have happened to come in while I was speaking, but um, otherwise we'll be um, here at the end for the Q&A session and can answer any then. Um, here's how you can stay connected with the BCRC on social media or uh, subscribe directly to our blog uh, and my personal contact information there if you want to reach out to me. And with that, I'll hand it back up to Taylor. Great, thanks Tracy. Um, so if anybody um, didn't catch that, Tracy did tweet out some links um, to a few things that she mentioned in her presentation. Um, so you can see her Twitter handle there, um, or you can give her uh, give her a shout on um, any of the beef research um, website or social media there. Um, lots of great info on research and um, some, some great things like those calculators that can really show the impact um, on the bottom dollar for producers in Canada. So that's super great to see. Um, I think we're going to just move right on into our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is Ron Glazer. He's the Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Canada Beef. And Canada Beef is the organization that's um, tasked with the investing the checkoff dollars in market development uh, and promotion, and that includes the import levy, as Melinda spoke about earlier. So Ron and his team oversee stakeholder relations, public affairs operations, and of course, the Canadian Beef Centre of Excellence, which I'm quite certain um, Tom, or Tom, no, Ron, <laughs> will tell you all about here in just a few seconds. So I'm just going to get switched over and get Ron unmuted and get the webcam on, and we should be good to go. I think you're muted, Ron. There we Good go. evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. We appreciate that you came on to the, the webinar, uh, certainly myself and the other presenters as well. We appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to you a bit about what we're doing with uh, checkoff investment and hopefully give you some confidence in, in what's being done on your behalf. Uh, as mentioned, I'm with Canada Beef. Um, and uh, I've, uh, I've been working in the beef industry now since about 1990. I started back then with uh, ABP, 
uh, from there moved over to the Beef Information Center back in uh, 2006 and then came over to the new Canada Beef uh, when we uh, were created in 2011. So I'll start my slideshow now, Taylor. Yep, so, sure um, to click through. Perfect. So Canada Beef, uh, we are the marketing division of the Canadian Beef Cattle Research Market Development and Promotion Agency. Uh, we're responsible for domestic and international market development. We have offices in Calgary Missis and Mississauga, Mexico, Japan, China, and Taiwan. Uh, we have approximately 28 staff, uh, including 12 foreign nationals. Uh, who are based uh, in our international offices. Um, our staff have a broad set of skills. They are marketers, brand managers, home economists, chefs, butchers, merchandisers, accountants, and communications professionals. Um, so before I get into, uh, you know, talking about some of the, the highlights of our Canadian beef problem, uh, programs, both domestically and internationally, uh, and also on the generic beef program that Melinda mentioned during her presentation, I just wanted to give, give you some general stats about the, the beef industry in Canada, in particular, uh, how we're doing with consumers. Uh, the last two years, we've seen year-over-year year year increases in uh, per capita beef consumption. Last year, uh, consumption was up 2.8% to 18.2 kilograms retail weight. Uh, total disappearance in Canada was uh, 907,000 uh, tons. Um, last year, uh, uh, market share in Canada was 75% domestically produced, and that was up from 72% the year previous. Um, we've uh, certainly seen high beef retail prices uh, over the last number of years and this combination of increased beef consumption and steady retail prices have supported beef demand. Um, beef demand index is an indicator of a consumer's willingness to pay for product. Uh, beef demand last year was up 1.8 percent and is currently at the, the highest level it's been since uh, the 1980s. Um, Certainly, uh, you know, our industry faces challenges uh, and on the consumer side, there's, uh, you know, there's certainly no shortage of detractors for our industry, you know, but I wanted to share those numbers just to give you a, a bit of sense that, uh, you know, while there are issues and challenges we need to face and need to address, uh, consumers are, are definitely still supportive of your product. Uh, they're purchasing it at a, at a very uh, strong price. And, uh, you know, that is most indicative of, of behavior is, is what they're actually doing in terms of putting on their plates and consumer or in consuming. Um, certainly, uh, the market is changing. Uh, you know, we're seeing the, the aging baby boomer demographic. Uh, we're seeing growth in Canada come from new Canadians. Uh, quite often, these new Canadians are coming from markets where uh, beef is not necessarily the traditional meal choice uh, or if they're eating beef or meat. You know, it's three to four ounces at a time, not eight to ten. Uh, you know, certainly you're seeing the growth of the, the millennial, the millennial generation. Uh, we're seeing uh, the Canadian diet diversify. The Canadian diet is beginning to look uh, a lot more like the rest of the world, and consequently, as well, due to exports uh, uh, and, the, and the growing middle class internationally, we're beginning to see the rest of the world's diet start to look a bit more like North America. So you're really seeing a, a blending of the two. Uh, as well, we're seeing, you know, strong challenges, not just from typical competitors, which historically have been chicken and pork and, and fish. Now we're seeing uh, non-animal protein uh, sources challenging as well. So um, before I get into our actual programs, it was mentioned how the, the, the beef uh, checkoff increase was part of the national uh, beef strategy, looking at how do we uh, strengthen and support the beef industry, not just for the current generation, but to, to make sure that the opportunity is there for young producers coming into the industry. Uh, under that five-year strategy, there were four pillars that were identified. Uh, Canada Beef is specifically charged to help support two of those pillars. Uh, the most obvious, obvious one is the beef demand pillar, where there's a goal to increase carcass cutout value by 15% by 2020, and then the connectivity pillar as well, um, 
which is you know across the industry collaboration among the various groups to address and work on on beef issues you know particularly with the uh, consumers and and uh, the general public on the retail side um, basically our, our vision towards the domestic market is this canada forms the foundation for canada beef to reach out to the further corners of the globe canada beef has continued to invest domestically to ensure that canadian beef remains the staple of canadian diets by focusing on brand partners with large volumes and influence and these are partners such as sobeys costco loblaw walmart federated co-op etc Canada Beef is able to ensure that these partners are well versed in Canadian beef and understand and can leverage the value of the Canadian beef brand. A good example of this is Walmart. Uh, last year, Walmart came to us. They felt that they were underperforming in the beef category. They came to us and explored, well, what are our options? How do we, how do we turn things around? We worked with them to create a 100% Canadian AAA program uh, that they've committed to. Uh, we partnered with them on the transition to the supply and then also to develop extensive marketing uh, using television commercials, social media, and in-store marketing. Uh, it's been very successful um, being able to partner with a, with, a, with a retailer like Walmart is, is allowing us to reach millions and millions of, of consumers, uh, not through our investment, but through theirs. And certainly Walmart has seen the benefit of this. Their, their category is much improved. They're very pleased with the performance and they're among the market leaders now in this area. A similar story is actually there on the food service side as well. Um, you know, last year we saw a couple of the, the large um, uh, fast food uh, uh, restaurants commit to 100% Canadian supply. That was Harvey's and Wendy's. Uh, Harvey's in particular uh, made that commitment to 100% Canadian beef and over 200 of their, their stores all across Canada. They invested heavily into television, social media and in-store advertising as well with a very similar effect, you know, resulting in millions and millions of producer uh, or consumer uh, uh, connections and exposures. Um, they have also been very pleased with the response to that. Uh, and similarly, you saw Wendy's make a commitment to 100% Canadian beef. We haven't done any cooperative marketing with Wendy's, but you're certainly seeing, you know, that trend of uh, food service and retail exploring and looking to connect with Canadians through 100% Canadian programming. I mentioned some of those non-traditional competitors. Here's a couple slide shots of of uh, dairy products and bread and cereals all claiming in uh, a high protein you know territory which historically has been just ours melinda mentioned our generic marketing program so about three years ago we started to collect on beef imports into canada uh, essentially uh, there's a formula that is applied to various beef products as they are imported into canada and it's meant to uh, create an equivalency value to a dollar per head, similar to what you're paying for your for your cattle. Um, that uh, that uh, import levy is generating over nine hundred thousand dollars worth of of revenue, which is uh, quite significant. In fact, it's uh, it's about half of our domestic marketing budget. Um, one of the the agreements that we came to with the importers was that uh, uh, the nature of the investment would be generic whereas the programs that are funded by beef checkoff uh, are strongly promoting a canadian beef brand the generic investment is just that it does not uh, cite a country of origin uh, whatsoever so when we looked at that we had to determine well what are the areas um, you know that are of equal benefit to imported beef and to domestically produced beef Essentially, those are the areas of health, nutrition, and food safety. Uh, so all of our generic marketing dollars are invested into those areas. Uh, on your screen, you'll see a website, www.thinkbeef.ca. I encourage you to write that down and go have a visit. That is where we place all of the resources that have been created and funded uh, through, the, through the import levy. And um, a terrific warehouse, storehouse of information ar around beef's goodness, wholesomeness, and uh, uh, you know, you'll find also that we specifically designed these generic programs so they can run parallel to branded programs and they'll be able to support one another. So, so you know, 
Canadian beef producers are seeing the benefit of this investment as well. And that was a very important uh, uh, decision and direction that we wanted to take with that investment. Um, this area historically has uh, focused on uh, things like uh, um, doctor and dietitian outreach. Uh, over the last two years, we've broadened that to include a new area. We've been working with Good Life Fitness Centers across Canada, uh, using the resources generated and funded out of this area, creating 15-second uh, uh, video uh, commercials, essentially, uh, that are played on video screens at the fitness centers, on the machines. Uh, and it's another way to reach an audience that has an interest in health and nutrition. Um, but is not those traditional uh, stakeholders like dietitians that are very difficult and expensive to reach. Uh, as well, the funding in this area is paid for, you know, some of our issues management initiatives as well, uh, such as response to um, uh, the recent changes or recommended, recommended changes to Canada's food guide. Uh, I know Tom under issues management is going to speak to that a little later in more detail, so I think I'll just leave it at that uh, regarding generic programming. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, significant branded initiatives that are, uh, you know, heavily utilizing uh, what we call social media. Uh, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, those types of awards or those types of uh, tools. Um, these are very cost effective in terms of reaching consumers, uh, much more so than traditional paid advertising. Uh, and, you know, with the you know, with uh, limited checkoff uh, available to the industry, uh, more and more these are what our, our investments are, are, uh, are trending towards. Um, I want to point out one thing in particular. Uh, we have uh, a, an app uh, that we developed a couple of years ago called the Roundup app. Um, it has been a tremendous success for us. Basically, we, we designed a tool that could be used on smart technology, so phones, um, uh, tablets, those sorts of things that the consumers have with them uh, when they're shopping at the retail counter or in their kitchen. Uh, it's a place where they can uh, get access to all sorts of information about Canadian beef, including recipes, cooking videos, uh, nutrition information, uh, as well as uh, information around social uh, license issues such as environment and animal welfare. Uh, essentially, it puts the information in the hands of the consumers and, and it's readily available available to them when and, and where they need it. Uh, we have about 14,000 users in that area now. And one thing we're particularly proud of is um, we were a winner of the 2017 Summit Creative Award. These are awards for uh, apps. Um, we were one of 5,000 submissions from 24 different countries and, and we won the gold medal for our product and we couldn't be more proud of that. Uh, I really encourage all of you uh, to go to your app store and uh, just look up the app or the Roundup. It's free uh, download. It's available in English, French and Spanish. Um, while our Chinese market doesn't have access to it, the, our Chinese office took all that same information and created a very similar application that they have in their market currently as well. So uh, um, it's, I really encourage you to go uh, and download that to your phone. I'm going to talk about uh, export markets now. So, um, you know, some very good news there. Uh, essentially, beef exports end in 2017 up by 5.7 percent by by volume and uh, six percent by value at, at 380,000 tons worth 2.4 billion dollars uh, our top four markets in order are the united states china japan and mexico the u.s is about 70 percent of our exports and the rest of the world makes up the the other 25 percent um, that's quite a change actually going back 10 to 20 years. Historically, the U.S. market has been more than 90% of our exports. Uh, you know, and that's been part of a diversification strategy that the industry has had uh, over the years. Um, even with the volumes that we export to the United States, uh, we're still niche marketers. Uh, with all those volumes we send to the United States, we still represent less than 3% uh, of their total supply. And that's actually the case in every market that we're in the single digit in terms of supply. So that really does shape how we um, how we market our products. Uh, you know, we're not out there to be uh, commodity mass marketers. We're working with specific 
food service and retail partners. Uh, when we do marketing, it's with them towards their customer base. And these are essentially companies that have uh, have looked at the Canadian beef brand, uh, see how it aligns with their businesses and are looking uh, to us as longer term partners. So a little bit of information uh, um, on specific markets. So in Japan, we're working with over uh, 570 retailers and 250 restaurants. We've seen tremendous growth in that market. Uh, they are up last year 27% by volume at about 26,000 uh, tons and 11% by value uh, worth about $160 million. Um, I mentioned that uh, they are our third largest export market and with the, the recent uh, CPTPP um, uh, trade agreement uh, we're certainly looking to see uh, new opportunities there as, as we get to benefit from tariff reductions, uh, especially versus key competitors like the United States and Australia. In China and Hong Kong, which is our second largest export market, volumes were steady at 29,000 tons uh, and value was up 8% to $242 million. Uh, certainly, we've seen tremendous growth uh, in this market. Uh, uh, you know, it went from virtually no no exports, you know, four or three years ago, uh, to number two now. And uh, uh, as China continues to grow its middle class, you know, around 30 million new consumers are entering the middle class. Imagine a market the size of Canada every year being added. Um, you know, the future is very bright for us in in, in China. Southeast Asia is uh, another area that we focus on, uh, based out of Taiwan, but using Taiwan as, Taiwan as a base. We're also, uh, you know, moving into countries like Vietnam, Singapore, the Philippines. Um, these have been traditionally small volume markets, but we've seen tremendous growth over the last couple of years. Last year, for instance, those markets by volume were up 193 percent, and by value, they're up 172 percent. Uh, each one on their own is quite small, but combine them all together, they represent about 2.5% of our total exports, which is you know, beginning to approach the size of some of our established markets like uh, Mexico. In Mexico, uh, it's our uh, number four export markets. Uh, it is a mature market, and certainly it's changed over the years. So you can say back to you know pre-BSE, you know, it was, it was basically a cow market for Canada beef. Uh, but over that time, uh, you know, through NAFTA, they've been able to grow their middle class as well. Uh, they've worked very actually hard to uh, grow and improve their own um, beef industry and domestic supply as well, uh, even to the point now where they're uh, starting to generate uh, fed beef products as well. Um, and the types of products going into those markets have changed. So, you know, it's, it's still, you know, cuts from hips and chucks uh, and thin meats, those sorts of things. But there's also a lot of uh, high quality um, product being moved into that market as well. And it's not just for what you would typically assume would be like the tourist markets in the, you know, in the Riviera there. But it's uh, also for the retail markets and, you know, being purchased uh, and consumed by, by domestic consumers. Um, last year, that market uh, grew by volume by 5%, uh, worth 17 to 17,000 uh, tons, and by value was up 4.5% to about $114 million. Uh, certainly, there's a, a bit of a Trump effect that we're, we're uh, benefiting from right now. Um, partners and customers who traditionally you know, we're, we're very uh, loyal to U.S. supply are definitely looking to broaden their supply and consider other options, uh, you know, based on the political climate. Uh, lastly, on the emerging market side, that's the European Union, uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, again, these are small volume markets, but with extremely high uh, profitability. Uh, we just finished participating at the Gulf Food Show in Dubai this past week. It's the largest food show uh, in the area. And, uh, uh, you know, our activities are generally exploratory at this time, but we do have a, a core group of repeat customers. Um, and certainly through CETA and in Europe, we're going to see opportunities increase in the longer term. You know, in the short term, we're still looking at how to overcome 
some of the regulatory barriers in term for trade in terms of food safety interventions that are in our processing plants and, and those sorts of things. But, you know, certainly there are long-term options and opportunities for us in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about the, the Canadian Beef Centre of Excellence, and hopefully many of you have heard about uh, this part of our business. Essentially, we created a, a teaching training kitchen theatre here in our Calgary offices uh, where we have state-of-the-art retail line, uh, uh, we have a, a retail bunker, we have a, a home kitchen, and then we also have a meat processing lab. So essentially, we were able to bring customers from all over the world to experience uh, uh, Canadian beef brand from gate to plate. Uh, they're in the meat lab. They're looking at different uh, cutting and processing techniques that can uh, aid, aid profitability. Uh, we take those products, we bring them to the front end, we, we cook and eat them with them. They're able to see what options there are for, for uh, food service delivery. Um, and then it's also we're able to take them through farm tours and packing plant tours. Uh, not only that, we're able to take um, uh, you know, our top-notch chefs, butchers, and home economists who are, who are working in the centre, and they're able to take their, their skills and experiences and knowledge on the road. For instance, our top chef and butcher were part of the, the mission to Dubai, working with their counterparts in that market to, to teach them about Canadian beef. Uh, you know, so our guys have been active not only here at the centre physically, but literally at locations all across Canada. Uh, we're very proud. Over the last three years that the centre has been operating, we've had visitors from over 32 countries. We've hosted 46 international missions representing about 242 different companies. We've had 42 domestic missions representing about 191 companies. And our customers who have come in have told us uh, that they estimate that they've generated about $380 million in new Canadian beef business, either generated through the centre or significantly influenced through the work in the centre. Uh, so, you know, we're just uh, couldn't be happier with, with our outcomes uh, to date there. Um, I'm going to wrap up here shortly, uh, but just very quickly about what our focus is for 2018 and beyond. Um, you know, initially we had a focus on technical attributes, the factual uh, uh, proof points that we use for marketing. We added to that a few years ago uh, the brand story, which is the emotional attributes. Uh, uh, we brought those two things together and now we're, we're moving into our next chapter, which is something we call um, customer value segmentation. You know, we're, we're doing high-end research to identify customer groupings by demographics, behavior, ethnicity, geography, et cetera, understanding what's important to them and how we can deliver products and, and uh, information that, that meet those needs. Um, and generally what it's going to do is, is uh, lead to increased awareness, improved perception, heightened product desire, and ultimately increased purchase. Um, taking that information, we're going to work uh, with our partners in the marketplace, both domestically and internationally. And again, uh, Walmart and Harvey's are great examples of how we're going to do this. We know that when we partner with these market leaders and their, their uh, competitors in the market see what they're doing, we know that this approach helps to sell more beef and is very influential in terms of those other customers. And, and you're, you're seeing that with a number of of players in Canada who are specifically making those commitments now to 100% Canadian supply. Um, in those international markets, particularly ones like China, uh, there's markets where the US and Australia have predate us where they're the heavyweights in the market, but there's other markets like China where, you know, essentially we've, we've had access at the same level and time as they had and, and we're, you know, we're essentially being able to create opportunities where they see us as market leaders, where our customers identify with Canadian beef as the highest quality product by focusing on, on uh, movers and influencers in those markets, such as celebrity chefs. Um, the international markets are critical uh, for Canada to meet its goals under the five-year strategy. Canfax Research Services estimates that these uh, export markets added about a, uh, over $500 of additional value to the carcass. So we need to uh, grow and protect our standing in those markets. And lastly, uh, with the Center of Excellence, uh, uh, you know, 
taking that that new information consumer information and approaches that we're developing coming together with our core partners domestically and international uh, working with the center of excellence we plan to double that 380 million in new canadian beef business that was generated over the next five years so that'll give you a sense of what we're going to do going forward with the increased checkoff uh, you know i'd better clear the deck for tom here and uh, afterwards we can answer any questions you have thank you Thanks, Ron. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a quick note about the Center of Excellence. So I've included the uh, Center of Excellence Twitter handle on the screen here. Um, Belinda and I's offices are just around the corner from the Center of Excellence, and uh, it's great to see how busy the facility is and, and the work that they do there to, um, to pr promote the industry and the product that we produce. Um, and just a quick little shout out to our, our new chef, Cam, who a little birdie told me might be on the webinar tonight. So um, we're happy to have him join our team as well. Um, so next, I would like to um, introduce Tom Lynch Staunton. Um, Tom is a manager of partner and stakeholder engagement at uh, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. Um, in his role, Tom oversees the issue, issues management program, among other things, um, and focuses on closing the gap between producers and consumers and working in, in the uh, arena of public trust. So welcome, Tom, and it's great to have you here tonight. Okay, thank you. You can hear me okay, Taylor? You betcha. I'm just gonna, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Just get all set up here. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for having me, Taylor, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I guess I'll be the last speaker unless we have a whole bunch of questions that we can answer at the end, which I, I hope we'll have some questions. Um, I'm gonna give you an overview of the issues management program um, and what uh, what we've been trying to do in this realm. And so uh, before I go into it, I'll just give a bit of background for those of you who don't know me. Um, as Taylor mentioned, my name is Tom Lynch Staunton. Um, I grew up on a cattle ranch in southern Alberta, uh, ran the ranch with my brother for a number of years until I had an opportunity to move up to Edmonton and work at the U of A. And I actually still work out in an office of the University of Alberta that uh, they allowed me to stay here, um, providing I can still uh, provide a connection between the researchers and the beef industry. So that's a great uh, thank you and shout out to the U of A. Uh, for allowing me to stay here, but um, I only work uh, part-time in this role. I started two years ago, um, hired by CCA to develop um, the issues management program, including a business plan and strategy. Um, right now, like I said, we're only uh, in a pilot project, pilot phase right now, I only work part time. Half of my time is with uh, CCA and in, in building this program. The other part of my role is working with Alberta beef producers in government relations, uh, uh, which works well because I'm here in Edmonton. So, um, so we're on a very uh, small budget at the moment. Where, like I said, I'm I'm part time and and. Uh, I also work with Stina Nagel, who is actually an in-kind contribution from CCA. So she's actually not funded through the checkoff right now. She is funded through uh, CCA as a contribution to help developing this program. So I'll get into the presentation here. So um, uh, everybody mentioned uh, uh, the national beef strategy. Issues management was built out of the national beef strategy as well by the organizations and, and where we fit, even though we're administered by, by the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, we play a role with all the organizations presented here, um, working kind of in the background as a hub to share information across our organizations to deal with the issues that we're dealing with. And where we fit under the uh, national beef strategy is really in the connectivity and beef demand pillars. And I'll get into those in a moment, but connectivity is about um, bringing our industry groups together, partnering with not only industry, but with government, academia, and other organizations that help can help us deal with um, 
issues and tell our story. Uh, and then the other piece of it is beef demand, because if we um, are able to tell our story in a way that, that makes consumers feel good about eating beef, then we hope that they will continue to buy and maybe even um, buy a little bit more, more beef in Canada or across the world. So the issues that I'm dealing with, and this is where a little bit of confusion comes in. I don't, uh, or we don't deal with uh, production-based issues unless there's a, a component of it which could become public or where public may have a concern. So um, all of our other organizations, uh, BCRC, um, CCA, Canada Beef Provincial Organizations, um, well, sorry, not Canada Beef, but uh, the other organizations really deal very well with producer-based issues. That's what they were designed to do. And uh, things like costs of production and innovations to uh, increase productivity at the ranch or efficiency. So, um, so where we're playing right now is, is um, in the public trust realm. And as I go through this, you'll see that it, it still does fit within um, sort of between groups like CCA and Canada Beef, um, but using the resources of all of us as we work through uh, consumer-based issues. So they're really a concern or event that could undermine trust in an industry or product. Um, they are built around uh, public concerns or, or consumer confidence. And it really stems from this uh, public approval or acceptance of how we produce beef. So it is really the consumers asking different questions than they asked before. And the reason why this is so important is, is we are seeing a huge disconnect um, happening between the public and our consumers and uh, what's actually happening at the farm or ranch. So this study, there was a study done by the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity. They've been doing some great work on consumer research, and they have found that 93% of Canadians say they know little or nothing about farming. And that's pretty concerning. And, and we also know that urban populations, because um, they're becoming disconnected from agriculture uh, more and more as generations are more far removed from the ranch. I mean, even 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, many people had a pretty direct connection to the, to the farm. And uh, whether that was through a, a direct relative or a friend, they had a stronger connection and now they're even more disconnected. And as uh, I'll take a quote from Ron from Canada Beef, who you just heard, and, and what's this doing? It's creating a uh, general unease in the public about where their food comes from. So going back to what uh, what our our strategy and goals are for the issues management program is one is that background create stronger connections and relationships among our industry partners so that we can efficiently and effectively address consumer questions. And then um, obviously we want to not only maintain the trust we have, but also increase um, public confidence and trust, um, which we hope would result in an increase in beef demand. And I've broken it down into really two main aspects of the program where issues management is about the background stuff, building the resources, gathering the information, training spokespeople, understanding what each organization's roles and responsibilities and core strengths are when dealing with issues and making sure we're coordinated in the background and then the public engagement is rolling out those stories that and information that we've built um, in the uh, issues management program out to the public and out to consumers and this is where um, a group like Canada Beef will play a large role in that piece because they already have made the connections to consumers and are in a perfect position to, to carry out the messages that we come up with within the program. So the disconnect is changing how consumers perceive agriculture. They're asking a lot of questions. 
But the questions they're asking now is not just about the product, not just about um, nutrition or tenderness or that taste experience. They're now wondering where their food is produced how, and how cattle are raised and whether you're taking care of the land and the environment you work in, if you're providing a good life for these animals that you're raising. So that's what they're asking. And you know, to couple this problem, the wrong people are answering these questions. We're seeing you know, Hollywood directors like James Cameron telling people to eat less meat. Um, just recently this spring, just, uh, just after the new year, there was uh, PETA bringing up uh, um, the, the issue that we should start taxing meat because they believe um, meat is uh, not good for you like tobacco is not good for you. And, and so we're seeing a lot of this rhetoric come up. We're even seeing doctors um, write articles encouraging people not to eat meat because they're saying that, that uh, vegetarian and vegan diets are better for you. And I find this um, quite dangerous, especially coming from a medical professional where people trust and they should know the, the uh, benefits um, as well as the impacts of eating certain foods. In addition, we've got people concerned about antibiotic use uh, in food. Um, one of the biggest ones today is, is people wondering about our environmental impact and our carbon footprint. When I first started this job two years ago, it was right when the World Health Organization and the International Agency on the Research of Cancer uh, released that they um, are, we're pretty sure there were links between um, colorectal cancer and eating processed meats. And uh, so that was a big concern. Coupling this, we also have um, advertisers that are, are perhaps not telling the whole story when they do certain ad campaigns. Um, and it's not what they actually say, it's what they don't say and imply about the rest of the industry. So when you read something like this as a consumer, you will automatically assume that hormones, number one, are bad for you, and that anything that might have a hormone in it is, is also bad for you, which is not true. And so ultimately consumers, all they want to do is feel good about their food, that it was raised appropriately, and even simply just where it came from. And then we can start to maintain that trust and build upon it. Most consumer concerns you probably already know about. The main things that we're dealing with right now, as I mentioned before, are the environmental impacts of beef production. And uh, I'll get into this uh, next is the, there's changes coming to the Canada Food Guide and their proposed recommendations that we've been dealing with are quite concerning and so, uh, working with Canada Beef and the Canadian Meat Council, we've been um, addressing those concerns and trying to stay on top of it. Uh, one of the questions we ask when, I, when we're developing this program is, well, how do we get people to listen and trust what we say is true about our, our story? And so, you know, we need to be ready to tell the story. And this is where developing those resources and key messaging is really, really important. Uh, we have to be um, able to take media interviews when media wants an answer to this and uh, having us in front of media um, will putting a face to the comments um, will build trust in people and making sure we've got appropriate spokespeople to talk not just as producers but making sure we've got experts and other subject matter people uh, doctors vets uh, academics and even government can help help us transfer the message. Uh, we need to understand what consumers um, are actually thinking in their perceptions and this is where a lot of the work that Canada Beef is doing can come into so that when we understand consumers uh, we should be able to communicate with them that much better. And of course when we're telling our story about how beef is produced 
we absolutely have to be transparent and professional and authentic, and it has to be based in science. Consumers don't always want to know all the scientific facts. They just want to know that they're there, and we better have them there when they ask for it. Um, we have to be persistent on this. It's not going away, and we, but luckily, we don't have to do it alone. We have many partnerships and programs that can help. This is just a small sample of, of the different uh, groups and areas that we can work with when we're dealing with issues. Obviously, you know, some of our own organizations, but we've got academia and government. Um, even media can, can help us get our story out there. And, and we need to look at media as friends for being able to do that and creating relationships with them. We've got uh, great examples of other industries like the dairy industry with their pro action um, program being able to build trust in, in consumers. And we've got uh, things we've developed ourselves like the Canadian Beef Co Code of Practice, which has definitely helped us tell our story about humane cattle handling. So I'll give a few uh, quick examples just about. Um, some of the initiatives we've worked on uh, to show you kind of how this process works um, when we're dealing with issues. I mean, we're doing quite a bit of stuff. This is a small example of, of what we've been doing. Um, I'll talk about the meat tax, eat less meat, and, and then of course Canada food, Canada's food guide example of, of how we're working to address these consumer concerns and how we're working uh, with all of our organizations to do that. So, as an example, when we get a, an article that's not telling the whole story or saying something like, eat less meat because it's better for the environment, well, how do we respond? And these are some of the things that we need to think about. Um, how, you know, we have to examine the issue from all angles. What are the things that we could say? Uh, do we respond negatively or positively? What sort of messages that we put out there will resonate with people and which ones will be lost in the in the mix. Um, this is where where BCRC plays a fundamental role in how we deal with issues because not only do they have the research to back up what we say is true, they also have the network of academic experts who we can call upon across the country to help um, relay our message. Um, and then we put together our key messages and we outline risks. We determine the best way to communicate it. Sometimes it'll be through print, it'll be through social media. It could even be through a interview on CBC. Um, and we share it with our partners so that if they're dealing with it, uh, either currently or at a later date, they now have the materials and the key messages that they can respond. And now we've got a coordinated message. And then, of course, we got to monitor it to see uh, if anyone was actually listening, if they were, and how we can make it better. So, um, you know, responding to to what happened uh, um, before, um, we um, we had a few few of these issues, uh, of course, with the meat tax. One, um, we responded to this. Uh, BC Cattlemen's was right at the forefront of responding to this because it came through the Vancouver Sun. And later on, there was actually an editorial from the Vancouver Sun um, that wrote an article on, on a tax to discourage meat consumption is distasteful. And a lot of that information was provided to the Vancouver Sun by Kevin Boone and his team out there at BC Cattlemen's, which they had in their bank from previously when we were talking about eating less meat and, uh, and that uh, you know eating less meat may not have the desired environmental effects that you think it might. Try and move some of the, oop, try to move back a bit. Well, we're, we're getting short on time anyway. Those were other articles that we, we did get published. Um, through newspapers like the Hill Times in Ottawa. Plus we responded to the doctor's article about, um, about what he was saying about plant-based protein 
is better for you. And so getting things published in these journals um, will eventually have an impact. And if nobody is responding to it, um, people will assume that those are actually true. And so um, this is why Canada's food guide uh, is so important for us to address right now. So Canada Beef and the Canadian Meat Council, they've been doing a tremendous amount of work because this is a, a product-based um, issue. They've already got all the information on, on nutrition and the comparisons of beef to other proteins or other foods out there. And the most concerning piece is about the Canada Food Guide revisions is that they were proposing that that we change to plant-based proteins instead of animal-based proteins, as well as a reduction in saturated fats. Saturated fats are present in, in beef and other animal-based proteins, as well as um, they were thinking about incorporating environmental impacts of food into diet choices. And while uh, environmental impacts are absolutely important and we need to address them, uh, confusing them into a food guide where nutrition and health is already so complex uh, could number one confuse people but it could even detriment their own health if they're choosing um, environment over nutrition uh, and in terms of our Canadian context of how we produce beef um, knowing that that yes you might be able to reduce um, minimally some ghg impacts uh, reducing cattle from the landscape may detriment things like natural grasslands that we're able to preserve through grazing so anyway um, because this was coming up and there was a public consultation canada beef was able to get um, a lot of key messaging put together we were able to coordinate a lot of our resources uh, we had a lot of great, useful messages that helped us uh, respond to this. Um, messages that, like these ones here, these are just an example of a few of them, um, that helped us respond and, and do a coordinated response uh, to the food guide and get in um, feedback into that process. So as an example, uh, there's been this rhetoric out there that, um, that people assume the rise in diabetes and obesity um, is partly due to increased meat consumption. But actually what's happened is red meat consumption and all meat consumption has actually declined since 1975, about the same proportion that these have gone up. So that says to me that meat is not the problem. As well, when people start to talk about eating less meat, well, how much less? Um, and in fact, we're actually eating below the current food guide recommendations of 150 to 220 grams per day. So um, in Canada, we're actually eating um, appropriate amounts and may even be sacrificing a little bit of nutrition uh, for not eating enough in some cases. Canada Beef has put together some great stuff. Ron talked about uh, the uh, thinkbeef.ca. I encourage you to check it out because there's some really good information about comparisons of, of uh, beef to other proteins. Um, you know, I, I like all these other proteins as well, but I, I fear that if we get into uh, replacing beef with two and a half servings of black beans, we may be getting into our own GHD problems on that one. Other resources that we did. So this was just a, uh, a key message internal document that we uh, helped Canada Beef put together uh, with input from all of our other groups that we could then share with our provinces. Um, we also had help from uh, concerned doctors that uh, uh, from across Canada that wrote two letters to Health Canada expressing their concerns about the recommended revisions and 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 they had um, had research that said you know saturated fats may not be the problem and that uh, steering away people away from nutritious whole foods 
such as whole fat dairy and red regular red meat was a, a danger to people's nutrition. So those types of messages help us um, communicate out to groups like Health Canada when dealing with something like this. And in terms of the environmental impacts, when people are talking about eating less meat, you know, in Canada, yes, cattle produce a lot of GHGs, but in, in, in our total GHGs that we produce, it's very small. So reducing meat consumption in Canada will have a minimal impact to your GHGs. And in fact, like I said before, you may be detrimenting the environment in other ways, like uh, reducing um, the amount of rangelands we have when we have to replace that beef with a, a crop of some sort. So in summary, uh, those are just examples of, of what issues management is. It really is a coordination of resources and groups to respond to consumer concerns efficiently and effectively. In terms of the Canada Food Guide, we were able to, to take all that information from Canada Beef and get it out to all of our provinces so that they and they could write their own letters to Health Canada, but plus their own provincial health ministries, expressing our concerns with the backup of good science to say why why it was dangerous to go down the road they were doing. Um, it's, get, it's about getting the production story answers to Canada beef and other people who are connected to consumers so that they can tell that beef production story um, to consumers. And uh, just one quick thing right at the end, we're going into the next phase of, of the issues management program um, where it will be funded uh, more fully through the through the increase to the national checkoff and giving us more resources to be able to uh, address issues as we go so that we can turn my position into a full-time position as well as uh, have a couple of other full-time staff available to deal with these issues and i put this graph up there because you know over time we have seen a decrease in beef production and we're starting to see a little bit of an increase here. And, and I think that's important. If we can use some a resource like issues management to stabilize this and, and keep per cap, capita consumption, make people feel good about, about eating beef, that they don't have to worry that beef is ruining the environment and, and they know that beef is good for them and can contribute positively to their health. Uh, those types of messages will ensure that this line starts to stabilize. And so we'll leave it at that. And if if anybody uh, has further questions about, about the program and what we're trying to do with it, uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, you guys can see Tom and Stina's contact information there. So if you want to make note, feel free to go ahead. Um, you'll be able to access it after, after in the recording as well. Um, but that actually brings us right into kind of into our first question, Tom. So we'll just move into our um, question and answer period. And um, the first question I had here is, um, and it's kind of applicable to all three of the service providers, but we'll start, I guess, with, uh, with the issues management team is um, where are their resources and what resources are there um, for facts and information to share on social media or when promoting our industry? Um, so is there somewhere that, that you can direct people or some, some resources that you can get in their hands? Absolutely. So depending on the issue, we've got uh, a whole bunch of fact sheets uh, developed, not just through um, the issues management program. So you can contact Steen or I directly, but there's also um, fact sheets with Canada Beef. Um, BCRC has some great factoids as well. Uh, as well as the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. So we've got a, um, we've probably got information um, and key messages built for just about every issue out there. I'm sure there's something that we, we uh, haven't developed as fully as we'd like, but um, we certainly have something. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, is there anything from a Canada Beef standpoint, Ron? 
Yeah, I mentioned these uh, during the presentation, but again, the, the thinkbeef.ca website has tremendous quick bite information about uh, nutrition and health. Um, you know, assuming you're not trying to write a scientific paper, that's a great place to go if you're looking for those factoids, those that quick bit of information. And, and again, the, the app I'd send people to as well. If you're looking for a general portable resource about all sorts of information uh, for beef that's really shareable, like this is, you know, this is built for, for that, that mainstream consumer, um, go get the Roundup app. It's free and for three different languages and it's a great place to grab that information. Perfect. Uh, Tracy, anything from the BCRC side? Yeah, well, the majority of our resources are um, intended for producers, but our factoids that Tom mentioned do do double duty, I think. So those are those square images, and I showed a few of them in my presentation. We've got uh, about nine total, I think. Um, and so some of them are related to the gains that we've made as an industry in reducing our greenhouse gas footprint, um, how much carbon our grasslands sequester, all the various different species um, that make their home on Canadian rangelands that support biodiversity and those types of things. So you can go on beefresearch.ca um, under resources and then images and you can find those and and those are great to share on social media. I'll also mention uh, the program called Beef Advocacy Canada. So Beef Advocacy Canada is a program that's intended to help um, or I guess kind of arm folks in the industry with the information um, and I guess tools to communicate about the industry and I guess kind of um, address issues and that type of thing. So um, it's, it's like a course that you can go through. So beef, uh, beefadvocacy.ca is the web page. Uh, they've also got a YouTube channel. So I guess just kind of search for beef advocacy in YouTube. Um, and they've got a short video there. It's, uh, it's about two and a half minutes long about the environmental footprint of beef production. So that's a great resource as well. Perfect, thanks. Um, I'm just gonna move right on into another question um, that is kind of for all three of the service providers again. Um, so is there any work being done that is applicable to the dairy industry since dairy cattle uh, do end up in the beef chain um, at the end of their lives, I guess. So uh, maybe we'll go back in reverse order, maybe this time, Tracy, if you wanna start and then we'll go uh, Ron and then Tom. Yeah, so some of the research that we fund that's um, also applicable to dairy producers would be um, transportation research or some of the other animal welfare research that's done. So the uh, transportation research in specific, um, specifically is looking at, um, you know, welfare outcomes of animals that come off of trailers and, and showing that cattle do come off in the vast majority of time in excellent condition, even in long haul trips, so that you know, to f inform that any changes to current transportation, um, we, we need to do that very carefully to make sure that those statistics improve and that we don't go further away um, from that 100% of, of animals coming off in good condition. And um, other research areas of mutual interest would be some of the animal health stuff like Yoni's disease um, and forage research, of course, would be another one. Um, improving forage yields and um, forage mixtures uh, for longevity and drought resistance and nutritional quality and all those types of things. So. Great, thanks. Uh, Ron, Canada Beef side? Yeah, you know, the obvious uh, one would be the ground beef market, particularly in Canada. Uh, you know, again, with uh, what I mentioned earlier with the food service partners, we've seen uh, tremendous growth and uptake in, in dedicated 100% Canadian beef programs. Uh, you know, a lot of that ground beef is from dairy cattle. Uh, and on the veal side, uh, most of our activities have been primarily uh, related to the export markets, particularly uh, Hong Kong and China, uh, Asia, and uh, the European Union uh, and the Middle East, where we've been working with exporters uh, who are specifically selling veal into those high paying markets. Great, thanks. Uh, Tom, from an issues management standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the issues that dairy deals with, consumer facing issues, we are also dealing with as well. So um, one of the forums that we've, we've 
gotten to know the dairy industry a lot better is through the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And dairy's been doing a, a great job on uh, the promotion of sustainability, particularly around the issues of environment and animal welfare, but also other social issues. And so um, coordinating with them, learning from them so that we don't have to do it ourselves is, is very important. So, um, you know, through that forum, we've been able to, to work uh, quite well with the dairy industry in addressing these issues. Canada Food Guide is a really good example of um, all animal proteins um, seem to have a bias against them. And so um, when we're addressing issues saying, you know, it's not just about beef anymore, it's about milk, um, other meats and eggs as well. So um, all those proteins can play a large role in our diet. and. Uh, uh, it's important to promote them as well as as beef when we're talking about animal proteins. So, yeah, we we are coordinating and sharing resources as well with the beef or the dairy industry. Great, it's uh, good to know all of us are playing in the same sandbox and and kind of looking out for the same goals. So, um, so far, I've got one question left. So, if anybody has any other additional questions, just make sure you um, get them into the question box or the chat window. Um, in the next minute or two here. So the final question I have is for um, for Melinda. Um, so what stipulations or requirements are there for provinces who allocate checkoff back for provincial initiatives? Right, um, good question. So as you recall, I talked about how provinces can allocate uh, national checkoff to the service providers that we've heard from tonight, BCRC Canada Beef Issues Management. Uh, but they can also allocate portions back for provincial initiatives. Uh, the stipulations are the same as the national service providers. Um, as I mentioned, we operate under federal law and we report to Farm Products Council of Canada. We submit annual business plans and annual reports. And provinces that utilize a portion of the national checkoff uh, go through the same process and submit to the agency an annual business plan for review as well as an annual report. Great. Um, I think that about covers it. I don't see any additional questions. So I think we're about ready to wrap up for the evening. We did go a little over. Um, uh, so I just want to apologize for that. But we did uh, get lot, have lots of area to cover. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, and we will make sure that you do get a link um, to the to the webinar tonight. Um, so we, we hope that you're leaving with a, a deeper understanding or a, a desire to engage a little bit more in how your uh, checkoff dollars are invested. Um, again, if you want some more information, um, our website is up on the screen there and you can definitely connect with us on social media. Um, we're regularly sharing information about um, how our partners, BCRC, Canada Beef and Issues Management are bringing value uh, to producers through their checkoff investments. Um, and keep an eye out uh, for the gate post on those three um, social media too. You can sign up for our newsletter there. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you again down the road on some future webinars. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>